Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar and for starting off your climate week um, and Monday with us. My name is Valerie, and I will be your moderator for today's panel. I'm the Waterfront Design Coordinator at Waterfront Alliance, and I provide business development and communication support for the WEDGE, or Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines Program. It's a national rating system and gold standard recognizing developers and landowners for resilient, ecological, and accessible waterfront projects. And a little bit of background on Waterfront Alliance, we are a US-based nonprofit organization with a growing alliance of more than 1,100 partners that focuses on environmental and economic development and bringing about real change to shorelines, waterfronts, and coastlines across the nation and in the New York, New Jersey region. So for Climate Week, Waterfront Alliance is centering on critical climate resilience issues facing New York City through a series of roundtable discussions, art exhibits and panels, coastal cleanups, and um, a webinar every day this week at this exact time. So make sure to check out our website to learn more about our events this week. Uh, but with that, let's dive into to today's webinar, which is getting community engagement done right with Wedge. So we all know that community engagement in design is critical. And the purpose of this panel is really to uh, explore the community engagement framework of Wedge, which again stands for Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, and the importance of engaging decision makers and stakeholders in bringing community engagement into building along the water's edge. Um, and now it's my honor to introduce you to our panelists today. Um, we have Lauren Messier. Lauren is an associate in the urbanism and planning practice within the Buildings and Places Group at AECOM Metro New York. With more than a decade of design and community engagement experience, uh, Lauren leads interdisciplinary teams on site-specific projects and large strategic plans that address resilience, sustainability, and the uncertainties of climate change for both public and private clients throughout the US and abroad. Lauren managed a team of engineers, designers, and planners on the Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Feasibility Study and Master Plan, which resulted in a series of capital projects slated to begin construction this year. And she recently oversaw landscape design and community engagement for Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery Coastal Resilience, a sea level rise adaptation, flood protection, and public realm improvement project along nearly one mile of the Lower East Side's waterfront. Next, we have Robert Curtis. Robert is a landscape designer with Curtis and Rogers Design Studio in Miami, Florida. As an early career professional at the firm, he has spent the past five years entrenched in all aspects of practice, from site analysis and community engagement to design and construction administration. With a dual degree in environmental studies and history from Oberlin College, his design interest focuses on the evolution of American urban landscapes throughout time and how communities of varying socioeconomic backgrounds interact with and understand natural and built environments. Robert was also instrumental uh, in assembling the wedge documentation for the adaptive redesign of Jose Marti Park in Miami, which was the first wedge verified project in the state of Florida and second outside of New York. And finally, we have our own Patty McKee, uh, Patty is the Senior Manager of Planning and Design at the Waterfront Alliance. She is a registered landscape architect and wedge associate. Patty brings her landscape architecture and urban planning lens to provide oversight to Waterfront Alliance's climate resilience study for Flushing Meadows, Corona Park, and other resilience projects. Patty worked on the ground floor to develop wedge and continues to grow the program throughout the New York region. Her passion for sustainable design and planning for diversity and resilience is evident in built work throughout the United States, Canada, and the Middle East. Patty has taught courses on green infrastructure on the waterfront and daylighting Tibbetts Brook in the Bronx at Hunter College. All right. Well, thank you panelists again for taking the time to join us today to discuss and sharing your experiences with us. With that, I will dive in and start off with our first question, which is, um, if you could tell us a little bit about community engagement for development projects and why is it important? I'll kick us off. Um, I think, at least in my world, community engagement isn't necessarily guaranteed in all projects. Um, and when it is involved in projects, it can kind of look at different, many different ways in a development project. 
sometimes a municipality is just looking to check a box, you know, and make sure that we fulfilled that. But I think the importance of it and the real, you know, value in community engagement, I think as a designer, uh, I think I have, we, we have a responsibility to ensure that we are listening to the user's needs of the development project that we're going to be working with them. Um, and ultimately, I think the success of, of that design is ensuring that what we heard from those users and in that community engagement then gets seen on that site and gets reflected back in the design. Um, so I think truly to have a successful development project, you want to make sure that the people that you're designing for have a say and that you understand where they're at in terms of what they need. Yeah, following up on that, I'd, I'd also add, um, I think those are great points, Robert. Um, you know, a lot of us are experts in our specific fields in design, and we do try to our best to get to know the neighborhoods in which we're working as well as possible. But really, there's no substitute for the knowledge and experience of people who are living and working and using amenities and, and resources within those communities. So hearing from them early on in the process um, to help us set some of the core project goals, priorities, um, thinking about how we want these projects to integrate into an existing community with existing users and existing kind of rhythms of daily life is really important. Um, it really starts the project off with a strong foundation. Um, and I think also, uh, especially as we're talking about, um, you know, specifically a lot of the work that I've done has been around waterfront resilience and flood resilience projects. And these are also, these are critical infrastructure projects, right? It's necessary infrastructure that we have to build in New York City for the future survival um, of these coastal neighborhoods. Um, and community engagement, when it's when it's not done right or when it's totally absent, um, can actually serve to derail a project. Um, if people don't feel like they're having a voice in the process, if they don't, if they feel like they're just sort of being steamrolled over by the city um, or that plans are getting made without their involvement, um, communities, I mean, people have a lot of power these days. There's incredible activism in New York City. Communities are very empowered. Community boards are very strong. Um, and if we're not engaging people appropriately along the way, um, it can actually impede progress on these critical infrastructure projects. So both from a, you know, the city's ability to move projects forward um, and actually see these realized as well as for the purposes of making the projects as good as possible and as strong as possible and as functional for the communities that we're building them in. I think community engagement is essential to the process. And to your point, Lauren, I think at least in, in, in the work that I'm doing in public work projects, these are taxpayer dollars that are going to the public work projects. And so making sure that public feels that there, is there an echo happening? Is that just I'll, I'll mute myself when you're talking. Sorry, I was just hearing myself twice. But yeah, I mean, making sure that, that these are taxpayer dollars, at least in the case of a public project. And so making sure that the communities feels ownership over that space, you know, I think is, is super important. Patty, you're muted. Yeah, Patty. <laughs> Every time. So, yeah, I was, um, it, I was just going to um, jump in and talk about, you know, why, uh, why it's important. Because, I mean, I've seen, you know, exactly what, you, what you're talking about, Lauren. It, um, it's changed a lot in the past because, honestly, a long time ago, you know, the, the community, pro uh, a lot of the times, like, the community engagement process was to check the box you know, exercise and just so that we could go ahead and do, do what we wanted or that's kind of how it seemed. But like you said, I thank goodness, like things have changed a lot. And um, for myself, I've learned so much. Um, and I've worked on a number of different projects with different engagement um, strategies and different engagement ideas. And so, for example, in the Middle East, I worked on a project um, <laughs> In, in Saudi Arabia on a public um, plaza where, you know, it was like there was, well, the, the sheikh is going to pay for it. So why is there any any need for anybody else to chime in, you know? Um, and then I also worked in a place in northern Canada on a project where um, we were not really allowed to speak. Um, you know, we were invited to learn about the community and to hear from them. And why would we bring, you know, an analysis of their community to them? So I've worked on very... Uh, you know, different projects and and seen a lot of different ways of thinking about it. So one of the things that I think, you know, 
has been great for me personally, um, because we've talked about how it benefits the project, how it benefits the designer, I think, and the team is that um, it's really foundational into, into really bringing like how we understand um, our job, because for myself, I come into every site and every project and it's like I don't the thing is we need public engagement because we don't know the story we don't know the story of the place we don't know the story that is locked in all of the people's minds who live there and who have who've grown up there and who know the concerns and the problems and the dreams of everybody so we really I'd like to start with the fact that you know we just it's it's a good idea to talk to people because we really don't know anything um other than the analysis that we bring to it and it's all kind of locked in to it so it's really foundational um to the approach of of how we do engagement all right thank you uh now let's get into the nitty gritty a little bit. Uh, what are some of the challenges with engaging communities around resilience issues? How does community education factor in? Uh, Lauren, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, uh, the challenges engaging people around resilience issues. I think uh, there's a bunch of challenges. Um, one, we're dealing with issues that are very, very technical um, and also somewhat abstract and future oriented. So what I mean is, um, you know, AECOM has led a number of waterfront resilience projects around New York City and, the, and New Jersey and the shorelines. Um, we have to work with communities and we have to talk about our, our goal, our, our, our job as designers is always to like integrate this hard engineering into existing waterfronts in a way that still provides you know a vibrant public realm at the end of the day um, to do that we absolutely want community feedback on the public realm portion of it but to get there first we have to talk about all the flood infrastructure right we actually have to talk about the hard engineering and i've worked on projects where community input in the engineering strategies actually led to a better project um, but to get to a point where we can engage with everyday people who are not experts and don't necessarily, some of them do actually, in some of the communities that we work in, people are architects and engineers, but you can't assume that everyone that wants to engage and have a voice in this process and should have a voice has that background. So we have to start by, and we have in projects where the first number of months, sometimes even up to like half a year, a year, depending on the length of the project of engagement is spent getting everybody on the same playing field, right? We have to do kind of an educational blitz. Um, we're going around, we're talking about what, what is the purpose of this project? What are the flood risks? What's the coastal science behind how we got here in defining these risks? How do we define what the necessary height of the intervention is going to be? Um, what design year are we designing to? Are we trying to pro provide protection for flood risks in the 2050s and the 2100s further out into the future because those all change. Um, what all the terminology that we're going to be using in talking to all of you, what all these words mean. Sometimes on projects we've started by creating a glossary of terms for folks so we can hand out at meetings and post online. So when you hear us, because we automatically slip into it, I'm guilty of it sometimes, we start using industry jargon, we start using acronyms for things and people are getting a little bit lost. So we try Certainly coaching our team not to try not to do that as much as possible in meetings and keep things um, in everyday language, but it, I think it starts from creating a solid foundation of education so everyone understands what we're doing here, why, why this matters, even though the impacts of it might not be felt for a couple decades in the future. Um, and and kind of setting that strong foundation and on that note, I also think since we're talking about projects that are often um, about future issues uh, and things that will become future problems. Engaging with younger demographics is becoming more and more important as well. And it is it is sometimes a challenge. And I feel like children, people who are still in school, people under age, the age of 18 because they don't vote yet are often overlooked in this process. Um, and getting our, our clients to put funding behind outreach into schools and outreach uh, to, to like neighborhood kids um, is sometimes a little bit of a challenge, but I think worth it in the long run because that's who we're really building these projects for. Yeah, actually, I, so, you know, it's funny after you, after you stop talking, Laura, I'm like, wow, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. <laughs> so, what was that? But, you know, so I'll just like bring it into it, you know, 
like I'd like I always have to keep things simple for myself so you know like it's kind of comes down to two things you know I think there's too many big problems or big challenges with with um engagement around climate change in particular I mean like you said it's 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 just it's too big you know it's 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 too big in terms of the 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 lead time, you know, I mean, because what's happening now, when you're talking about the improvements, or even the, they're, they're going to be two generations, you know, generation or two generations around the corner. So, you know, um, that's difficult for people to get their minds around. It's not immediately relatable, you know, um, I mean, my family's from the Canadian prairies, so they're like, it's not, you know, it's an academic thing. It doesn't really matter to me. So, you know, actually getting people to really understand it's easier, you know, in New York city when you survived, you know, a couple of hurricanes and Miami and, you know, um, but it's, um, it's, it's hard for people to really understand how it affects them and how it affects their their family. You know, and that's really what what how you get things done is people have to really care about them, right? So how do you engage people and really um, help them understand the immediacy? I mean, it's getting hotter, so that's you know it's easier actually to talk about the heat than it is about the flooding if you haven't been directly exposed. And then I also think that there's a a care that needs to be taken because there's you know, there's this, this thing kind of called climate dread, you know? Um, and so because it's not an immediately solvable problem, it's easier to just stick your head in the sand and maybe we don't have to talk about this. It's a difficult thing to talk about for agencies, for governments, for design teams, you know? Um, how do you have, you know, there's so many more immediate things that need to be uh, have money spent on it. So I think it's really difficult to um, talk about these things in a pro in a proactive way and say we can because, you know, these are big problems that don't really have solutions at the moment. So there's how do we how do we gently like you said, talk to the ch talk to children and talk to the next generation about things that are not really that that pleasant. Um, but I think that brings us you know, to another challenge that I found in, in, in projects, and that's that um, it becomes the big educational moment, I think, um, is talking around, people are still kind of com comparing, um, well, the idea of doing nothing, you're comparing the cost of doing this to the cost of doing nothing. And normally the cost of doing nothing means everything stays the same, right? Whereas now the cost of doing nothing means nothing stays the same, you know, all of them, so for example, um, the small and a large example, a small example is, you know, we're working in a park and um, people say, well, you know, in order to create some of these mitigation strategies, you know, you can't take away this pathway or this, this ball field that people use because they want to use it. But actually, we're not taking away anything like nature is, <laughs> is the water's coming and, you know, um, you can't use it already. You can't use this pathway. You can't use this ball field certain amounts of time. And in the future, it, you know, in 20 years, it may be completely underwater. So um, the cost of doing nothing has, has changed. And then the larger, you know, some of these larger um, projects along the, you know, the community, um, like the, the shoreline, the coastal community shorelines, um, the cost of doing nothing, um, is actually mean you may not actually you know be able to stay in your community. Um, so these is a billion dollar project, yeah. Um, and there's a long lead times, and you're going to lose your parks. These are all really difficult uh, questions and conversations to have. But the cost of doing nothing, um, I think that's a big thing that we have to have to talk about, and it's a different equation at that point. I think Lauren and Patty hit the nail on the head. I think the only thing I wanted to add in, in listening to you too, I think just as far as finding successes in those challenges or overcoming those challenges, I think on the one hand is finding finding a point of entry for the community, finding something that's relatable to them that they can connect to um, and get excited about. Um, kind of, and, and part of that I think is just breaking down the larger issue into smaller concepts, I think can help a lot. And then the other thing I, oh, it's slipping my mind right now. Um, Patty, you were saying something about, oh gosh. Okay, it slipped my mind. If it comes back, I'll, I'll shut it up. Well, I wanted to, to chime in with uh, one other thing. So keep thinking, Robert, maybe it'll come. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking, yeah. Or I'll just distract you further, who knows. <laughs> um, but Patty, as you started talking and you were kind of um, echoing back some of the points I had made about how this is, you know, it, it's a little rough, tough to wrap our heads around, right? It's, it's a future issue. It's a little bit abstract, it's farther off. I also thought of a counterpoint to both of our points, which is that sometimes, and some of the engagement I've done in some communities, it's not something that's abstract and far off. We're engaging with communities who were directly impacted during the last big storm. And I think on the on the flip side of sometimes we're trying to get 
uh, you know, get people riled up about something that is a future abstract long off pro uh, uh, problem or, but on the flip side, we're also sometimes dealing with communities who are like, it's been five years or eight years or 10 years since the last time we had flooding and like the next big hurricane is coming and could come any day now. And what are you guys doing? Like, why has it taken so long? Why wasn't there a project built immediately afterwards? Um, what's going on? You know, the funding was in place. Why is this here yet? And so I think also trying to provide as much transparency into the process as we can, that these things take a long time to do right. It takes a long time to for the city on the policy side to make decisions about what the big moves are going to be to getting a, you know, a project funded, um, to then doing preliminary site investigations, to making sure we've done all the studies, all the correct coastal engineering, all the geotechnical surveys, getting all the data that we possibly need to make decisions, then making then getting through like initial feasibility study, you know, analyzing concepts, moving those forward, engaging with communities through the whole way. That also takes time. Uh, before we're even talking about actually designing the project. And so I think transparency in the process as well um, and frequent or it, it appropriate, at least somewhat regular check-ins with the community, even when maybe we don't have a ton of updates to share, but just to let them know, hey, here's what is going on in the background. Here's what we are doing. And here's when we think we're going to be able to come back to you next and what we're going to be going to be ready to talk about at that time period helps allay some of those concerns or the, the thought that folks have been maybe abandoned or forgotten about during this process because it it's I wish we could build things overnight, but it takes time. What do you think, Robert? Did it come back to you? <laughs> <laughs> it came back to me. So Patty was mentioning about like these large infrastructure projects that sometimes you're going to have to elevate an entire segment of shoreline and that's going to cause some major kind of re, you know, restructuring of this park. And so you might lose some river walkway that was once there, some lookout point that is really important. And I think you can, I mean, to your point, I think the community can get very bogged down in, in the frustration of like, okay, well, it's been so many years and nothing has happened. And all of a sudden the city's, you know, somebody's coming in and making these huge changes. And so I think as designers and as somebody who actively participates in community engagements, like you, you really have to get good at pivoting with the community and and rather not like not focusing on the limitations, but finding a way to envision the future and envision kind of the possibility for what that revamp site might look like and how some of the things that may have been lacking on the site before could be, you know, adapted and made better or, you know, improved upon. And I think I think finding those points, I think, is one way to get people excited about adaptive redesign, you know? Yeah. Thank you all. Um, and Patty, I love that framing of the cost of doing nothing. Um, and so now that we've talked about all the challenges, I'm wondering how do we make sure we get community engagement done right? Uh, specifically, how do we begin to hold ourselves accountable? I think, uh, I mean, Holding ourselves accountable, I think it kind of means that we have to be an advocate for the community. You know, I think we, uh, Lauren was mentioning earlier, I think that that just got me thinking about like in many situations, at least in my world, like we are playing the mediator between the client who is kind of a public entity and the, you know, the stakeholder or the community. And so we kind of have to, in many ways, we have to push for what the client, I mean, push, you know, balance what the scope of work is on the client's end, but then also advocate for what the community needs and, and kind of uplift them. And I think part of getting it done right, I think it was mentioned earlier, um, was kind of doing your research. I mean, kind of doing all that background work ahead of time so that when you come into the community, you kind of have a sense of where everybody's at. I mean, obviously that's not going to inform everything, you know, there are things that you'll find out uh, through conversations. Um, but doing kind of thorough research into the community that you're entering into, I think is very valuable. Um, I think on another end, like making sure that it's effective is providing multiple paths to input. Um, so, you know, not everybody is going to be able to scan the QR code on your thing and, and fill out the online survey, you know. Um, not everybody is going to be able to show up to that one public meeting that you're going to have. And so offering multiple meetings over a series of time, I think thinking of it more of, as a, a long-term process than just a one and done sort of situation, I think is one of the ways that you really make it effective. And I think with that, kind of the incorporation of feedback loops, I think is super important. So like your first meeting, you're documenting everything, you know, heavily, and, and we'll get into that with Wedge because I think that's kind of one of the benefits with with the Wedge is that is that 
that level of documentation that is asked of the designer really ensures that what you're capturing in the beginning then gets carried through all through the end. So on the point of feedback loops, it's like making sure that in that first meeting where we're just, you know, having a casual picnic and we're getting to know people's, you know, opinions and desires and their feelings on things that, you know, when we have a follow-up meeting two months later, where we start getting into the nitty gritty about, you know, let's look at some sea level rise maps. Like let's start having these little, you know, let's get into the weeds here. You know, um, we can also kind of loop back and say, here's what we heard from you last time. And here's how we're incorporating that this time, you know? And so that, that feedback loop kind of comes throughout the entire design process. And, and I think, again, that's one of the values of, of Wedge, which I think we'll talk about that. So as soon as the question was read, Robert, I jotted down um, three things, inclusivity, metrics slash documentation and reporting back. And I think you just, there you, go. you just touched on all of those. Um, if I can add a few things to some of those points on, on the inclusivity front, I think you're totally right that single point in time engagement is no longer the thing that works, right? Having like a public meeting where everyone is asked to come in person is just not realistic. It's great. And I love in-person engagement. I was, um, saying to our organizers the other day, cause I ran some of the conference. I was like, Oh, I wish we could be doing this webinar in person. Right. But that presents challenges. People have people have very busy lives. They have caretaking responsibilities, younger children, older adults, they have jobs and the hours don't always coincide with when we're, we want to hold engagement meetings. So webinars like this uh, make it easier for more people to engage. Um, but even then schedules don't always line up. So I think multiple, as you were saying, multiple um, touch points and multiple types of touch points. So if it's a really critical project, we try to offer an in-person workshop with people follow it up maybe by an online Zoom meeting, post all meeting materials, everything that we showed at the in-person workshop or on the online thing, post them online so that people can go in and access those in their own time, whenever they want, have it be something that is posted online and people can provide feedback there publicly. Um, so just making sure we've really made as many avenues open as possible for anyone who wants to have their voice heard, that they have a way to do that. Um, and on the inclusivity front, I think we also need to always think about multiple languages. Um, so that starts with doing some analysis early on in a process and figuring out what languages in the community that we're working would make the most sense. Do we need to be offering live interpretation during meetings? Do we need to translate things? Which languages do we need to do that in and making sure that we're not just doing outreach in English um, if we're working with communities that are multilingual? Um, and yeah, I would just can't say enough about the report back loops. Um, we tend to open every public meeting starting with what we heard last time. And I think it's really important to, that we're thoroughly documenting that and that we are reporting back to the community, not just the when we have answers that people are going to want to hear, but we have to report back, hey, here's, you know, here's a list of like 20 things that came up at the last meeting. These 10, we don't have answers to yet. They're in progress, but let people, letting people know that we still heard them. And we are working towards that and approximately when we're going to be able to come back to them next time with answers. Sometimes the, the responses are not what folks are going to want to hear. We have to tell them openly and honestly, this request is simply not feasible, but then back it up with why not and show them that we actually did the analysis. We took it under consideration and why we can't move forward with that. As well as, of course, we're always happy when we can share positive news and say like, yes, you asked for this last time and here it is today. Um, but I think it's really important that that when we don't have the positive answers, that we don't just kind of bury those things in the sand and pretend like we didn't hear them. We have to we have to be upfront about it with people. It builds a lot of trust in the process. So yeah, I I kind of want to focus on um, on the who who are we being accountable to. Um, so, I mean, I think this is a really, to me, this is like one of the crux questions, you know, is accountability. So, because we've all been doing this, we've been doing this for many years and we've, you know, sometimes we get it right, sometimes we don't get it right. And we're learning all the time how to make it better. And all of the strategies we just talked about are making it better. Um, so I always wanna just kind of check in on, on the pulse of, of it and think like, for myself, it's like, who, who are we being accountable for in our designs? Because there's the client, right? The person who's paying for it. Um, there sometimes the client is the people who are um, 
who are basically running the project. They're the agency who's going to be developing it for the community um, or a private developer. But there's also the user, you know, and this is a, more, a little bit amorphous in landscape and urban design projects, right? In public projects, like who's going to use it? Who's going to use it now? Who's going to use it in a hundred years? You know, um, there are certain First Nations um, groups that, you know, um, start every council meeting with, uh, you know, every decision. We have to look at the ramifications for seven generations. So who are we designing for? Um, and it's the user and, and the users are um, the people who will use the space, I guess, you know, I mean, who are they? Hopefully we're, we're making sure that we know, you know, we've done this and we've figured out who these people are, right? We've done the analysis, we've done our due diligence to figure out who they are. But I also think that the other user that doesn't usually get a, a seat at the table um, and doesn't have a voice is, is nature, you know? So there's ecosystems, there's all the species in the ecosystems that, um, that need, um, they are also using the earth. And every site that we have is part of that earth. <laughs> you know, we like to have jurisdictional boundaries and 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 monetary and ownership boundaries, but really, uh, you know, the how we use the space is and who uses the space. These are these these are these transcend boundaries. How we op operate in our city, and again, how how species use the site. Um, so I think is how do we bring accountability to all those things? And that's one of the things that I, I love about Wedge is it's built in one of the what are the pillars are designing, doing things right for ecology as well. So that, you know, as a landscape art architect, you know, brighten brightens my heart. And and I guess the la, the other thing is um the answer for me, how do I, you know, um, how do we really know? that I've done it right, <laughs> that I've gotten it right. I can make sure that I do all the strategies, but you know, knowing if it works or if it really worked or, is such kind of like, a, again, a long lead time in terms of, it's almost like a post-occupancy evaluation. Like you look over generations, did, the, did this become a beloved space in the community? Did it become a derelict, underused, non-flexible parking lot, you know, or not parking, but like an open, you know, space? Like what, how did it become used? So I may not, I may not revisit it, but so so coming back and, you know, going back to our spaces and seeing it they're used is important. But at the same time, I think it's also like we don't really we're not going to know sometimes um, if we got it right. So sometimes it's a feeling. Could I have done more? Could I have done it better? Let me look at all the ways I could have done it better so that I can do it better next time. These these are things that, again, are, are uh, they're almost feeling. So it's another reason why I, I like wedge because it actually gives you a checklist to say did you did you do these things the best way possible and it makes me feel better to know that you know as as far as i could i've done it I, i've done as much as i could um because i'm really probably not going to know <laughs> thank you so feedback loops transparency and the who uh these are all really great rules of thumb uh so thank you and we touched a bit on Wedge, so let's pivot there. Uh, how does Wedge use the community engagement framework? And uh, Patty, why don't we start off with you? Okay. Um, well, Valerie gave us a good introduction to what Wedge is, the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines. Um, and what exactly that's what they are, they're guidelines. Um, and so as we've heard, you know, we've, we've been doing these things as urban designers, as designers, as landscape architects, we've been doing these things. Um, and a lot of times we've been doing a lot of good things. Um, and so Wedge has collected these good things and they've collected these experts and, you know, in the field of design and engagement and made a list of this is, you know, this is basically how, if you're wondering how to do it, let's, let's, uh, do these check boxes and at least you know you've started it right so um and these these guidelines and suggestions and strategies um are collected in um in the wedge manual under mostly under credit 0 0.3 on um, the development um and implementation of a plan for equitable stakeholder engagement well named <laughs> so um and the intent of this is to engage stakeholders um throughout the the vision the design and the the implementation um, stages of the project. Um, and the goal, of course, is to create waterfronts that are um, welcoming and equitable for everybody. Um, and so the way that the wedge manual um, is structured is it has strategies for doing this uh, and then a scoring for um, how well did you do this? So one of the first things is uh, that you need to have a plan. So like I said, we, we all, 
know how to do this. We have these best practices, but let's put it down in writing. And then it's something that everybody can be can be held accountable to. And a lot of these things, again, they sound like like things we've always been doing, which they are, but it's all collected in a certain way. So the two ways that uh, the two kind of lists that uh, that which um, uses is let's uh, there's strategies for planning and then there's strategies for execution. Uh, so the plotted, uh, some of the strategies for planning um, are they're guided by um, the, the strategy. The planning is guided by a framework. So um, who is engaged is in that framework. Who are you engaging? Um, how do you determine? You know, how do you do the analysis? Determine who are the right people that should be engaged in this in as stakeholders. And again, stakeholders. Um, who? What do you mean by stakeholders? Are they the people that are paying? The people that are using? Um, and are how are they going to be engaged? You know, um, you've got to meet people where they are. Right. So how are you going to engage them? Um, you know, it's great. We have this we have this online platform today. But as Lauren said, you know, um, some people maybe don't have computers. I <laughs> mean, It sounds unreasonable. But yeah, a lot of people don't have access to this technology. So it's an environment. Uh, it's an environmental, um, you know, justice thing as well. Right. Um, so does everybody have the means to do it? Does everybody have the brand, the, the broadband, the ability to to um, have Wi-Fi? So um, how are people going to be engaged? And. And also, what are the concerns? How do we identify what their concerns are? You know, it's not just about the design intent of the project and what we're going to get done is what are we going to what are we going to meet? What are the problems? And sometimes some of the concerns don't even have to do with the project. Sometimes some of the concerns are, um, well, you know, what about um, the fact that there hasn't been any engagement in the last 10 years or 20 years in these projects that, as Curtis were say, were kind of jammed down people's throats? intergentrification, you know, um, and so in your project, you know, you're coming up against some of these trust issues. So how do you, you know, it's about building trust and having those conversations. So the first, you know, some of the execution strategies are um, the best one still um, is meeting people in person. It's still going. It's still going to those events that are already occurring. We're doing that currently in Flushing Meadows, Corona Park. Like, go, you know, do they have um, some events that are already happening? Uh, you've got to go to the marketplace where, you know, I did this in Pennsylvania in, in, a, in, a, in a project. You know, they we had only like a few people show up in the evenings. But, you know, we found out that thousands of people go to the market on the weekends. So we set up a table in the market on the weekends and and so, so such great, great feedback. So, um, yeah, so that's that's fun. And then also activities when they get there, you know, I mean, nobody really wants to be lectured at. So let's have some fun activities that people can engage in. And honestly, I learn something every time um, somebody does one of these activities. It, something always comes out of it. Um, and then... I think one of the important things that that Wedge focuses on that um, that I found is really really important, and and we talked about it a bit is that is is the opportunity for feedback, you know, and you know Wedge scores you on like do you have feedback at ten percent and seventy five percent of design, you know, because it's great to go in and get the get the input, um, but a lot of times you know there's only two or three places where you come back to the community. We're asking them to invest in this. We're getting their ideas. It's really important that we can show them how their ideas actually change the design. So um, just to, uh, I think one of the best ways to talk about how Wedge holds us accountable um, and how it operates is just to go through quickly to go through the scoring. So each one is scored each. Uh, so the the, um, the credit 0 0.3 will be scored and there's 10 possible points for community engagement done right. So um, the uh, and there's also other credits that you can get. So you have to get to 130 of the 250 to pass it to become wedge verification, which means you're like part of the like one of the best and the best and that you know how to do you've done this waterfront project right right Curtis <laughs> um and so you can get two points for uh evidence of early engagement uh you can get two points for um identification of the, how it influenced the design um did you listen and did, were there changes based on um, um the input one point for showing multiple stages of engagement you know you've got like I said you've got to come back early and often and one point for um, engagement during the construction phase. I think there's an extra point for this because it's so infrequently done. And it's so important to come back during the construction phase and get that iteration of, you know, <laughs> there's got to be an opportunity to change things if they're not working. Um, and then, like I said before, there are also, there are other 10 other credits that you, that 
require community engagement in order to get the points at all. So that's just a, a general overview. Of course, I think uh, Valerie's included in the chat, uh, um, you know, link to the um, wedge so you can download and learn more about, about these, but that's just a, a general overview. I think the other benefit too, Patty, is that uh, well, I think I, if I'm correct, a lot of, or at least a few of those credits require operations and management afterwards. At least I think when it comes to like providing programming and making sure that that programming stays relevant over time and as well as like things like maintaining views, being able to access the water, things like that. So a lot of those things are encouraged or at least require, yeah, required by Wedge to kept, you know, keep, keep track of those over time. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Jose Marti because I think, I mean, a lot of the things you were mentioning, Patty, were things that I think things that we thought about in Jose Marti. And I think something that's interesting that I think I would impart upon everyone who's listening today is that one of the things that I really thought gave Jose Marti Park that project just kind of the upper edge right from the beginning is that a lot of the community engagement was baked into the RFQ in the beginning. And so the RFQ had been developed alongside the Van Allen Institute, which is a nonprofit. I think it's based out of New York. Um, and so they had done, a, the RFQ had come on the back of a bunch of, you know, research with trusted community leaders in that community. And so when we were brought onto the project as designers, there was already kind of, a, you know, some foundation of an understanding of where the community was at. And so that kind of gave us a jumping off point for all the other outreach that we were doing. And so again, like some of the, you know, we, we had multiple points of engagement. That first meeting that we had was just a really casual picnic. And I think the really, the success of that picnic was in having those trusted community leaders already reaching out to those, reaching out to their kind of networks and being able to bring all those people in, you know, I don't, I don't think we would have been able to do that in the time frame on our own, you know? Uh, and so given that relationship that we had with, with these trusted leaders, I think that really gave us the upper edge right from the beginning. Um, so yeah, I just I have think, to as I best interject and say I think the picnic is the best idea. <laughs> Community something casual. I know <laughs> nobody wants to sit in a meeting like the the whole like sitting on the chairs and then having a PowerPoint up there. Like I get it, you know, but you want something more casual. You want like you want lawn games. I think we had like we had um, somebody who was working with us at the time was an artist and so she had done like a huge mural of the park and and it was completely blank. It was just black and white, and so the kids were. We brought all these different colors and it was just like, what do you want to see in the park? And so we had different stickers and different ways for kids to just get engaged. And I think that alone helps like, I mean, a single parent who's like, I can't come unless I have something for my kid to do, you know, it's just like, or, you know, it's late at night and it's like, I need to feed my kids, you know, it's just like, I can't go to this meeting at 6 p.m. because I need to feed my kids and get them in bed afterwards, you know. So if I can bring my kid, feed them and have a game for them to play you know, while I go to this meeting, it's like, I think that's, it, it's little, but it, it ends up being a tremendous, you know, it's like, we end up seeing people come to our meetings and it's like, I wouldn't have come if I didn't have these things, you know, these, these simple things. Yeah. Thanks for the great foundation on Wedge. As a follow-up question, how can Wedge be used to bring decision makers and stakeholders together? Um, Robert, uh, let's yeah. start with you since you've worked on a wedge verified project. I think I had written some some thoughts down. I think more than anything, like I had said that wedge really demands a system of accountability that commits the decision maker to meet the desires of the stakeholders. Um, and I think in, in terms of our story, like we had really gotten the city's commitment to do wedge as, as kind of fulfilling as kind of reaching the standard of excellence when it came to waterfront design, just because Jose Marti is one of the first climate, I mean, one of the first large climate adaptive redesigns in the city of Miami. So they're really kind of headed out into the unknown on this. And so part of the RFQ was like, we want to develop solutions, the solutions that we develop at this park, we want to apply at other places of similar condition, you know, so it's like, we knew that we had to get this right and be comprehensive in our approach for this one so that everything, everything that happens subsequently would kind of follow this process. And so I think I think one of the interesting things that came out of, of Wedge and Jose Marti is that we, at one point, once we had gotten the commitment to do Wedge, we had presented the city an opportunity to seek funding. Because I think the other thing that we don't, sometimes don't talk about is like adaptation is expensive, you know? And so the city had some funding, you know, there was some 
funding mechanisms in place. But when the the overall bill came out for the design of the re, the, the park, it was like their eyes were popping out. It's like, oh my goodness, we don't have that funding. And so, you know, trying to find that funding, we ended up applying for, we had presented to the city, um, it's an FDEO grant, the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG grant. And so we introduced them this funding mechanism and the funding mechanism was directly tied to serving the needs of the community when it came to resilience. And so having the commitment to wedge, and, and at this point we were already kind of pretty far into design documentation, you know? So we had already kind of developed these different elements that were influenced by the community. Um, but at that point we kind of had the city's we kind of had, I don't want to say their hands tied, you know, because that's a little bit, it's, I don't want to make it sound too negative, but more than anything, we really had the cities locked in and saying like, listen, we won't get the funding unless these things get followed through with, you know, and if we want to get the funding, if we want to see this through, we need to make sure that these elements stay through all the way to the end. Um, and I think more than anything, yeah, I think that just really made the city further accountable to follow through with their intended design and what they had written in the scope of work from the beginning, you know, because I think sometimes that can happen as part of a project is like you have your big scope of work and your big vision. But then as you kind of go through the design process, some of these things get axed out, you know, through the process. So having wedge and having a funding mechanism that all kind of interrelated and connected to each other really just like locked us in in terms when it came to fulfilling the needs and desires of the community. Yeah, and I think it's actually really, really important that communities know that they can they can request that wedge be part of the RFP process. That works really well. Um, you know, we're happy to go on, um, you know, and give testimony during the planning process, or you know, enter into understandings with with community groups and and yeah. you know allegiance alliances. And so, um, yeah, that's a really great way for that wedge can help is is to actually become part of the process of the R of the RFP in general. Um, and another way um, that the community, oh, I lost my train of thought. Go ahead. Okay, but I have yeah. So. Well, what was because I thought something and now I'm, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, also, um, but I think and just kind of echo that as I think, oh, yeah, yeah, I think getting things in as early as possible. So if communities are interested in this, requesting it to be in during the RFP process, and also for anyone who is a community advocate or sits in your community board, um, you know, making a desire for engagement and the types of engagement known to decision makers as early as possible, because for those of us who are responding to RFPs that come out from the city or from clients, um, you know, often community engagement is, it's noted in there that they want community engagement. And they're like, provide a scope for doing community engagement. Right. That's great. And I am happy to all day long list out the most robust scope imaginable. We love doing engagement. We'd love to think of super creative ideas, lots of different tools that we can create, but all of that costs money, right? So we all have to put together a proposal for this. Uh, and that has to be competitive against other bidders as well. And so it's it's very helpful for us to have some definition of what the community and what the client basically are looking for in the RFP so that we can make sure we're responding you know, accordingly. Should do we need to make this something that's really rigorous and includes, you know, everything but the kitchen sink, or is this going to be a process that necessarily, for whatever reason, given the project parameters, uh, has to be a little bit more streamlined. So I think trying to have more clarity in that. Basically, the more clarity as early as possible in the process makes for a better process longer term. And Wedge does require that um, an engagement plan is actually part of the process. It's part of the project. So, and the community, the community can request to see that plan. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. You know, like they, it doesn't get signed off. It doesn't get started until the community has seen and approved the uh, the engagement plan. Well, I don't know about approved, but they've seen the, the the engagement plan. You know, and at the and that that whole thing within the engagement plan that's part of the upfront process. I think the thing I was going to add was just that, at least in our experience, having all that documentation as part of wedge, just even beyond community engagement, really streamlined our permitting process. Um, I think it was interesting that we got all of our agency permitting before we got the city permit. And I think the city saw with the ease at which we went through the permitting process, they then ended up kind of encouraging wedge in their uh, ordinances and their code of ordinances. Cause I think more than anything, it ensures when a reviewer 
an agency reviewer comes to look at this and sees kind of the breadth of information that we're providing them, it's kind of reassuring in that like, okay, we've really crossed our T's and dotted our I's here and, and done everything that we can to ensure that we're, you know, understanding the context and meeting all the conditions that need to be met as part of, you know, some of these permitting processes. And it's a, when we're a third party verification process. So, you know, we're accountable to ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. and we're accountable to the project. But um, I think that's also helps in the permitting process, you know, and I think it also helps to build trust between um, the client and the community. Yeah. Thanks. A uh, smoother permitting process never hurts. Uh, but yeah, it's great to hear all these ideas about how Wedge can be used as, you know, an advocacy tool um, and holding all of us accountable. Um, and now I have just one final question before we jump into the Q&A. Uh, would you all be able to share some final thoughts on getting community engagement right? And we can, I think we can make this kind of a lightning round. Okay, I'll, I'll just start off because what comes to the top of my head is just, um, um, really, it's about humility, and um, and coming into like I said, coming into um, to every situation, understanding that there is no silver bullet. Um, you know, even if you go through the whole wedge manual, it's not going to tell you there's a there's a way to do it. You know, you've got to come in and really, um, really want to get it right. Really want to to get it done right. Yeah, I think sometimes, as at least in our, we're a small firm, and I think that's. I don't know. I guess I I'm kind of using that as a as a primer because I think the reality is that sometimes we don't always get paid to do these community engagement process. Kind of like what Lauren was saying is that sometimes you present this really big thing in concept, but then that kind of gets axed out. And so to a certain extent, like back to kind of I guess humility and accountability and being transparent. Like as designers, we want to make sure. And back to the first question, it's like you want to make sure that at the end when this project is fun, uh, all done you want to see the community enjoying the space that you've created and so I think sometimes we will knowing that we might not get paid exactly what we want to get paid we will still go through that process because as designers I think we feel it is our responsibility to meet the needs of the community you know so I think that's just maybe as a small firm and just as a personal kind of on our on our mission but it's just like we want to see it get done right so if that's what it takes then that's what it takes and I think, again, I mean, coming back to Wedge, I think Wedge then like really solidifies that, you know, that, that locks us in on that, so. Um, I also think, just trying to think about th things I haven't already said here. Um, I think also one thing I haven't really touched on is the importance of managing expectations through the process as well, especially up front. So um, as much as I've talked earlier about the importance and the value of community engagement in a project and how much this can make a project so much better. There's also, I think we need to make sure we're communicating very um, openly and transparently at the beginning of the process about where there's limits to engagement feedback as well. Um, so we need to clarify where it is, what parts of a project are we looking for community feedback to actually inform the end result and what parts really are, are more that we're sharing out for information that aren't subject to change, right? So there might be some fundamental policy decisions that are underlying and, and kind of part of the foundation of a project where we're not gonna go back and revisit and change those at this stage in the game. Or um, earlier, Patty, you were talking about, you know, there also needs to be engagement during construction or, you know, at 75, 90% of design, then in construction, absolutely 100%. But that engagement looks different than it does at 20, 30% of the way through the design, right? So once we're starting into construction or we're finalizing everything, we're not gonna look for feedback that's going to fundamentally change the whole scope of the project, right? So I think um, in order to make it really effective with communities, making sure that we're, we're very clear about where and how much and what kind of feedback we can accept and can be responsive to at different phases of the project. Absolutely. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so we have four minutes left. Um, we do have time for Q&A. Uh, so one question I have here from the audience is, what are some examples of your favorite activities to engage people and who have they worked for? Oh, there's so many. I'll My favorite are always the ones with, like, with kids, like getting kids involved, <laughs> the way that you can get a child involved and get, I mean, uh, talking about, especially when we talk about climate resilience and who who are we designing for? It's like, yeah, this. This park, this place is going to be here for the next 
50 years or something like that, you know, and so it's like this 12 year old kid is going to be the user of this park for many years to come. And so, yeah, I think finding any way to get them involved in a way that's structured, you know, I think it easily, obviously, you know, things, children's activities can get very out of hand, you know, so finding some structured way that you can receive input from them. Um, yeah, much like just like a coloring activity or something like that with different types of stickers. And so based off of the selection of what they choose to put on the board kind of starts to influence where are they gravitating? What are these things that they're gravitating towards? I think with Jose Marti, it was just like, there was such a desire for butterflies in the park. I mean, some of the kids were just like, I've never seen a butterfly in this park and I would love to see a butterfly in this park. And it's like, okay, like I can do that. It was some, <laughs> you know, or even just like water quality. It's just like, I would love to get in the water and touch the water, you know? And so things, simple things like that, I think can really go a long way um, as far as informing the design. Three cheers for more butterflies. I'm all yeah. Butter. I was like, <laughs> oh my God. I was like, uh, we were we were getting pelted with some heavy questions, heavy hard hitters. And then it was just like, I want more butterflies. I was like, yes, <laughs> love this kid. this kid. I want more feedback like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I second that. Anything that's that's hands-on and interactive um, and certainly engaging with kids is really fun. We actually did do a coloring book um, for the Brooklyn Bridge Montgomery Coastal Resilience, part of Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency that was distributed um, uh, to schools in the neighborhoods and to kids at public meetings. You know, the thought was, it was, you know, this kind of low tech, it was just, you know, two pages front and back, like a little booklet um, that talked about flood risks and like what this project is doing to protect and then like improvements we're making to the waterfront. Um, and I think that's a great way to like start the conversation, right? If kids are coming home and chatting about this with their parents at the dinner table, their parents are gonna start listening and caring, right? It's, it's like, and again, we're, we're building for those generations. So it's great to have them start getting involved. Um, and then on the flip side, uh, we also did, because part of our engagement during that, um, for that project overlapped with COVID. So then we also had to find ways of doing stuff that was not so hands-on and face-to-face. -face. Um, so we we developed these like 3D, 360 degree kind of virtual reality animations um, and then posted QR codes down along the waterfront so that people could stand in a specific moment in the waterfront by themselves, you know, masks on, not inter interacting with people, scan a QR code and then show on their phone and be able to kind of scan around and see exactly what that that exact spot would look like in the future once the project was built. Um, so again, I, th I think actually just finding finding new ways to be creative in this process yeah. and coming up with new tools that we didn't think of before and haven't used already to tailor fit to a project is is what gets us really excited. Scavenger hunt. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I love how our faces just light up when we think when we talk about these activities. So yeah, more of those. Thank you everyone for uh, taking the time to go through this webinar today. Thank you to the panelists for all the insights that you've shared. Um, and we have more uh, webinars this week, like I have said. Uh, and if you want to check them out, it's on Waterfront Alliance's website. But yeah, thank you for joining us again. Thank you, panelists. Have a great rest of your climate week. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Happy climate week. Happy climate week.